today on Hitch 20. I can see him thinking, and that's fascinating. A new model of suspense. The whole thing is tension because we know the secret, and everybody's this close to finding it. How did Hitchcock make a tiny light bulb more menacing than a dead body? With this episode one more mile to go, we learn the cinematic power of understatement. No. Much has been said about the 52 feature films that Hitchcock directed, but nobody talks about the 20 television episodes he also directed. The Hitch 20. In the early days of film, it didn't take long for directors to realize that movie cameras could do something unique from other forms of storytelling. Cameras could travel through geographic space, and tension could be created from characters running and hiding within wide expanses. The chase became a dominant story tool and has become a mainstay of movie making. For Alfred Hitchcock, however, Chases were something a little bit different. I'm sorry, old man. Too bad. Keep trying. They were an opportunity to break away from the Hollywood cliché, and he found ways to turn the chase on its head. Take, for example, the chase in One More Mile to Go. The focus of suspense is not the dead body this man has hidden in his trunk, but on something a lot more trivial. A simple, loose wire on a tail light um, causes the whole chain of events to unwrap for this guy. By using this proxy suspense device, Hitchcock inserts humor into the situation. He often referred to this technique as understatement, where the focus is on something comically small instead of the more chilling situation at hand. Looks all right. While the policeman obsesses over the broken light, it sets up suspense as he gets closer to stumbling upon the body by accident. But how does Hitchcock generate suspense? Hitchcock's three-step suspense structure revolves around hiding a secret, creating close calls where the secret almost gets out, followed by a surprise twist. In this episode, the emphasis is on the cover-up. Hitchcock begins here by actually withholding information from the audience to get their attention. We start off in a really long shot of a cabin, and then as we push in, we see through the window a couple fighting. It's a very voyeuristic shot, and we can't really make out what they're saying. But you can certainly tell that they're fighting. So we really don't know what the argument is about. Um, and that's a bold choice for a director to make. And the reason why I think Hitchcock makes it is because he wants the viewers to play a proactive role in the storytelling. We begin to project. We, we, we project our own ideas, our own thoughts, our own suspicions onto this scene. Now, is what they're saying important? Not at all. It's the fight. The, the fight between these two is not an important part of the story. And Hitchcock doesn't let us hear it. And what's interesting visually is how we have this window pane with the line that divides the two people fighting. There's one particular pane that is cracked, noticeably so. This is the moment that breaks him. And on a larger scale, it's indicative of a marriage that is broken. And then the protagonist does something wrong. In this case, a criminal act. Now we know what's going on. We're suddenly given important information that only the protagonist knows. Now, at the moment that he strikes her is the moment we go from outside from being a voyeur in the story to instantly inside with him. So that point is where the story for us starts. And he picks up a shovel and he looks at the shovel. So we know that he's thinking, oh, I'm going to bury her. And then he puts the shovel back and goes, no, not going to bury her. So without a word spoken, we know he's changed his mind. And I can see him thinking. And that's fascinating. That's character development, and that's character being revealed to me in as organic and, uh, and authentic a way as possible. Like, if he'll, if he'll look off screen to the left, and then we'll cut to a, a burlap sack, we know that he's looking 
at that burlap sack. Even though those two shots are disjoined, perhaps even in real life from in geography, they're not really next to each other. By putting them together, we create this storytelling. We create this narrative through the use of cutting. He starts throwing chains and, and rocks and everything. So we're like, ah, he's going to you going to sink her in the water. We spend a full five minutes of screen time watching Sam cover his tracks. By spending so much time with the protagonist and being lured into his subjective world, we can't help but feel a certain empathy for him. And then after he puts, his, puts her in the car, wraps her with a chain, puts the heavy objects in there to weigh her down, we get a few more moments of driving. Just driving where nothing really happens and the reason we spend that time with him is to build a connection once you have that audience connection you create suspense surrounding whether he's going to get caught the second half of the show is very much his guilt withholding a key secret from one of his characters was how hitchcock generated suspense in his audience creating playful anticipation around whether the secret is going to get out Sam has the unfortunate luck of running into basically the world's nicest cop. And this cop is just funny because the cop is in his space. What that does is it immediately makes him an obstacle. He doesn't get a speeding ticket. He doesn't get a ticket at all. In fact, the cop just wants to help. He tells him to go back to the gas station. At the gas station, the cop's even trying to open the trunk for him to try to fix that light. Later on, the cop returns the $5 to him that he left at the gas station and invites him to the police headquarters where he can get his car fixed for free. He probably would have had dinner with the guy if he had the chance to. The policeman gets so insistent about such a trivial thing, it pushes Sam's anxiety higher and higher. So the question becomes... Will Sam's guilt get the better of him? The cop didn't suspect anything. I think the cop was just lonely. It's boring out there. And the only person he's got to talk to is that red guy from the Super Bob's service station. He's probably a little loopy anyway. But, of course, we know the secret that there's a body in the trunk. So, <laughs> so uh, we just want the cop to go away, too. What makes this tension so palpable is the extra detail. We closely follow the procedure of replacing the light bulb, almost in real time. The longer it's on screen, the more the suspense about the body rises. The whole thing is tension because we know the secret and everybody's this close to finding it. The policeman innocently takes a drink. Close-ups of faces build tension. Quick pans of the camera from one character to another hold on to the screen tension. And then Hitchcock's camera moves to another secret, as Sam hides the key to the trunk and lies to the policeman about it. The dance continues, and the audience is delightfully held in suspense. 